Today, my guest is Chris Ressa. Chris is the Chief Operating Officer of DLC Management. DLC is a vertically integrated real estate firm that owns and operates retail shopping centers. They own more than 80 shopping centers uh, and north of 15 million square feet in the eastern half of the United States. Portfolios valued at more than 2.5 billion. He's also the host of the new podcast, Retail Retold. And in just a minute, we're gonna speak with Chris about the real state of retail real estate. But first, a quick reminder, if you like the show, CREPN Radio, you can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we invite you to leave a comment. We'd love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you'd like to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, and that's Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Chris, welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. All right. Well, I am definitely looking forward to talking with you uh, about retail and uh, just the, the state of retail. But before we get started, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Sure. So um, from uh, I, born and raised in Northwest New Jersey uh, in the town called Byram Township, middle of nowhere. So grew up on a mountain in the woods on a lake. Uh, and yes, it's still New Jersey. Um, in, you know, lower middle income, even probably, you know, lower than that type of area at some points during the recession and went to Rutgers University. I wrestled at Rutgers. <sighs> was applying to a ton of jobs uh, my senior year out of college. One of the jobs I applied to was Sherwin-Williams, the paint stores company. Ended up uh, getting a job in their corporate real estate department. So I was out there looking for new sites for new stores, for district offices, and you know, working on you know, with the industrial warehouses. Really liked the real estate. Uh, my passion wasn't necessarily the paint business, uh, but was the commercial real estate. And so I pivoted and moved uh, into the landlord side of the business. You know, I was started off as the tenant and went and worked for uh, a developer in New York City, had a short stint there, a company called Ashkenazi Acquisitions. And then I went to DLC and uh, I started off as the, through the leasing ranks. So I was, you know, was given a number of shopping centers and, you know, my job was to go find tenants for them. So negotiating deals with the retailers as, you know, the small local mom and pop pizza guy all the way up to the Walmarts of the world. And that grew into me taking on uh, leadership and management positions. Uh, you know, we have a large leasing team, everything's integrated. And then pivoting to the chief operating officer where I oversee our leasing, construction, property management, and marketing teams. Awesome. So you've uh, you kind of got the bug while you were uh, in the paint business for the uh, real yeah. estate side of things, huh? Yeah. Well, I was doing real estate, but it was just opening up paint stores, finding new offices, things like that. But I was on the real estate side, but working for a paint company, corporate real estate job. So in the capacity uh, for Sherwin-Williams, were you negotiating leases or more just finding the location, what we thought would be a, an ideal store? Or? So we were, I was all of it. So we were um, finding the locations, right? With the, the department along with the operations team would put together a strategy of markets that were holes where we wanted to be, stores that were needed to reload or stores that needed to close, which was very few. And, you know, there was a big push at the time because a large contingent of Sherman Williams business was contractor based. So wholesale and the high margin business was the DIY. So starting to increase their presence, uh, you know, into front and center locations. So we were looking for new markets. We had put together a strategy and we were looking in new markets and uh, for new stores. So we would find the sites you know, we would work with local brokers uh, at times and at the time that we didn't have exclusive brokers, you know, it was our job to really make sure we knew the market, find the site, uh, and then negotiate the deal with uh, the landlord. And, you know, that created things like, you know, working on because we were opening new stores, maybe we had to add a district office and, you know, working on things like that. So I got 
you know, and they, they had a lot of industrial real estate, right? They manufacture paint and things like that. So it was really good because I had a lot of exposure to different types of leases, different types of product type in commercial real estate and understood how a large chain thought about growth. So it was really uh, a good perspective. No, and I'm kind of curious just uh, in, in thinking this through, you having been exposed to uh, commercial real estate from a tenant's perspective, essentially is what you were, you know, the side yep, you were the looking at there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then moving to more of the landlord uh, management side of things. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you have a, um, uh, your experience was uh, more than, um, you know, what others may have had if they were just strictly on the commercial real estate side of things to have some sort of a tenant perspective. Yeah. So it was a long time ago. It was in the early 2000s. So now that's, you know, I, I, I probably, uh, I've probably forgotten more than I would like to admit from those days, but uh, certainly understand, you know, at an early age, how they look at the strategic portion of it. So putting together a plan and how they're identifying markets, what were some keys for them as it came to site specific things in the market. And, you know, it was a public company and how they look at the, you know, the rental streams in leases, how far out they're looking at lease renewals, what they're, what they're looking to do from that perspective on a portfolio basis to uh, make sure they're at market rents or below market rents. Right. So, right. No, that's, uh, that's, I always find it interesting when, when people have the opportunity to, uh, you know, change sides or, or, you know, operate from the other side of the table. Uh, it, it seems like the, the experience on one side would give you some insight, uh, you know, maybe a leg up as far as the competition, if you knew something that might be appealing, uh, yeah, intimately. I think, I think the biggest, the, so I think the biggest advantages depend on if you're transitioning sides, what your personal core skill sets is. Knowledge is only power if you can execute. There's a lot of great ideas out there that no one's ever heard of because somebody doesn't have the ability to execute on them. And so, you know, one of the, the big challenges from what I'll call in any sales going from the buyer to the sales side is, you know, are they a buyer or a seller? I think if you're on the buyer side, but your natural tendency is sales, right? And that's what I was doing on the, you know, when I was leasing space is, you know, I was in sales, I was trying to get these groups to open up new stores. There are a lot of people who make that transition real smooth because they take the knowledge that they have on the buyer side and they go to the sales side, uh, you know, on the different side of the uh, industry and they crush it because they've got this knowledge. They already had the sales skills and they can do that. If you were really a strategic, you know, person, good, you know, negotiator and your technical skills were just on point from a real estate perspective, you know, the pro formas and things like that, but not necessarily great at walking into a room and pitching people and, you know, selling the dream and evoking emotion out of people, I still think the, the transition would be challenging. And so I think whatever your core intangible skill sets are, you should follow those. And if you can bring along knowledge from the other side, it will help. But if you don't have those core intangibles, it's still a tough transition. No, I agreed. Agreed. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the state of real estate and, or, excuse me, the state of retail uh, real estate. Um, and I'm wondering if you can, based on your experience, talk about, you know, where it's been, what we've, you know, and I'm trying to think of how far back uh, is useful because I know there's um, a lot of things that, that has been uh, written, uh, not necessarily this year, but in maybe the last five years or so, there was all sorts of, of uh, comments on how retail was dead and, and, or, and I say not, not all retail, but I know that there's been certainly some, some businesses that have been uh, hit by the Amazon effect and, and that kind of thing. And um, I wonder if you can, can walk us through that a little bit. Sure. So uh, 
I, I borrow my friend Jason Ciano of Sabre Real Estate's uh, term, the real state of retail. Uh, and I think, you know, when you start, you start, you know, how did we get to where we are today from a product perspective and consumer driven economy for years led to the growth of a need for a significant amount of retail. What, what then happened was, and I think the part that's missed uh, a lot, is there are a significant amount of different types of retail. There's more types of retail products, of real estate retail products, than there are any other real estate asset class, right? In office, it's pretty simple. Is it class A, B, or C office? In retail, you've got enclosed malls, outlet centers, power centers, gross anchored centers, neighborhood centers, freestanding buildings, lifestyle centers, mixed use developments, and they're all operate differently. They're all in the same industry, but completely different businesses. And so I think when the media paints a broad stroke and they say retail, everyone encapsulates all retail and you know, an enclosed mall and an unanchored multi-tenant building with three tenants that has Starbucks, you know, Verizon and the nail salon is as different as an office building and an industrial building. And so to that end, the broad strokes has painted, you know, uh, a picture for everyone that I think has a lot of holes in it. And so that product type was driven because of all these different types of retail buying channels that people had, right? And so that's what happened. And now we have a new channel with, uh, you know, with online, which has disrupted a lot of different channels. And so, you know, you had fashion, which was typically, you know, apparel driven in the enclosed mall world. And that's how that happened. And so at one time, the malls were 70% plus all apparel. Uh, you had outlet centers, which came to be this, you know, manufactured value where, you know, uh, consumer brands could have their own stores. That popped up. That was a way to get to direct to consumer. You had category killers that ended up in this, you know, can I get as many products in one sector under one roof? And these power centers came with the sporting goods and office supply chains. You had all these front and center multi-tenant building came, you know, built with and freestanding buildings for these, you know, impulse buys like Starbucks and McDonald's. You had this lifestyle centers, which is, you know, the word lifestyle is used in everything today, especially on social media, but these lifestyle centers that were fashion, were high-end fashion plus some mixed use and they were walkable and outside and they had, you know, dog parks. And now we have all this different retail product that is so different uh, the brands are so different, yet they're put under one umbrella. Yeah, no, I think that that is one of the dangers when you, you know, you you limit the conversation to you know one word and think it encapsulates everything. There's, I mean, it's never all bad, uh, yeah. kind of thing. I mean, it, but I think that it's it, it is easy, and I think that uh, what I've seen here, and, and you, I appreciate you breaking down the different types of of a retail because I don't know that. Uh, we've necessarily got into it that that um, granular. To, yeah. Well, but I think it's it's very important because as, as I'm as you were listing them off, I could I, I could recognize each type, you know, uh, of an experience that I have, and recognize those that are doing very well, and those that are that are perhaps struggling, or or ones that I recognize that have are challenged. Yeah. And um, so I wonder if you can um, uh, identify some of the the characteristics of of that, that are making these different types healthier or where you see the health in the retail uh, real estate right now and, and what makes a healthy, uh, you know, a, a property. Yeah. So let me answer that in a second. I'm going to back okay. up sure. to one of you, you asked two questions in one, which was what am I seeing with the Amazon effect on, on retailers? So, you know, bold, but I, I don't know any one retailer who has gone out of business because of e-commerce, not one brick and mortar chain. It, it's made it more challenging and disrupted. I think 
e-commerce has made some retailers better. If you look at what Walmart's doing today, they bought Jet.com, Bonobos, all these brands they're doing, you can buy online and pick up in store. It's made them a better retailer, the ability to do online. When you look at some of the, the, the brands that have gone out of business from a retail perspective, you know, I think one of the most iconic ones is Toys R Us, which I think they were north of 250, but under 300 on the Fortune 500 when they filed for bankruptcy. They had a revenue of over $11 billion. So the internet maybe played a, a factor and the internet, you know, maybe their sales were higher, they were, you know, Fortune 300 company. So their sales, they were still selling a ton of toys through brick and mortar stores. People talk about, when they talk about Toys R Us, oh, they missed because they didn't, they, they, the experience in the store, they didn't evolve, they didn't evolve. I hear that all the time, they didn't evolve. Don't disagree, they could have made changes in the store. Nonetheless, people were still buying a lot of toys out of Toys R Us. They went bankrupt because of the fundamental business attributes that forced companies to go bankrupt, which was they took on too much leverage and they couldn't cover their interest payments. And it, it's that simple, which is they had more debt than they had cash flow to cover it. And it, did online perpetuate that quicker? Potentially. But it wasn't because Amazon came and people were buying toys on Amazon. It was they were still selling $11.5 billion worth of toys. That's a lot of toys. And, and, and so they were still selling out of, they had online presence. They were still selling. Majority of their sales were coming out of people walking into stores and buying. Um, and buying. I think private equity, you know, sometimes can be a great thing for retailers. And sometimes it could put them in a debt position that's really challenging. And I've seen, you know, over leverage be a much bigger challenge for retailers than anything else in the bankruptcy uh, world. And so I'm not blind to the fact online is disruption, um, but the good brick and mortar retailers are seizing the opportunity. In fact, most retailers report that when they open a new store in a market, their online stores their online sales in that market increase. And when they close a store in a market, their online sales in that market decrease. Hence, why you see all these digitally native brands, Warby Parker, Untuck It, started online and started to go through and now have tons of brick and mortar locations. When you look at the online sales, you know I think 50% is Amazon. It's really Amazon versus every, everyone. It's not online sales versus everyone because at the end of the day, the big myth is that the economics of online retailing are cheaper than having rent and being in a brick and mortar location. And that couldn't be more untrue. If you and I wanted to open up a t-shirt shop online and we opened up, we were selling t-shirts, it would be the cost of, the cost of entry is inexpensive, no doubt. The minute you want to scale and you need distribution, supply chain, warehousing, you need, and you have all these returns that are happening and the customer acquisition costs. What I, what I've, what I, I had uh, Melissa Gonzalez, who's a pop-up retail expert on my podcast. She said when most of the digitally native brands reach about 10 million in revenue, it's an inflection point where they typically need stores or they're in trouble. Because the, you know, the customer acquisition cost, I've read, I don't know for sure, I've read the customer acquisition cost on digitally native brands is like $200 a customer versus brick and mortar retailers, that's $10. So that Delta, yes, you pay rent in a brick and mortar store, but the economics today, there are very few pure play, and now there's very few pure play online shows, but the ones that are pure play online retailing, there are very few who are making money on e-commerce. At some point, that will have to come to roost and you will eventually have to show a profit. Uh, and a lot of them do not today. So their growth has been exponential, right? They're gobbling up market share by doing this, no doubt but it's not profitable market share today. Will it be? I think the consumer has spoken 
and they want the channel of e-commerce and they have to buy and there's going to be a place forever that you can buy online there's no doubt about it but there's going to be something that happens where the economics have to change you know she can't buy four shirts and return three and pay no shipping and you make money it's just not possible Right, right. No, it's funny you, uh, as you mentioned that, I mean, that seems to be the allure right now is you can buy all this stuff and return it free, no shipping kind of stuff. But I remember when cell phones, they were basically giving those away and, and just trying to get people on the network, you know, talking kind of thing. And now you try and buy a cell phone and it's no longer a free phone. It's, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sa same concept. Yeah. You know, at the moment, the big boys, right. And, I, and I'll call the big three target, Amazon, Walmart, who are all crushing it online. And Walmart and Target are doing a fantastic job in brick and mortar. You know, one of the ways they are, they are able to start being profitable online is buy online, pick up in store. And when customers do that, there's been a recent study by the ICSC, International Council of Shopping Centers, approximately 85% of customers make an additional purchase in the store when they buy it online and pick it up in store. So that is... Um, I think the number is 85%, but it's high. Uh, yeah. And and so those three, though, they have such deep pockets and they're, you know, they're in this race to the bottom of free shipping, all three of them. And it's putting pressure on everyone else from an e-commerce perspective. Those three are are definitely making it challenging for everyone. They, the, all three keep growing sales. All three are crushing it. And all three are doing innovative, amazing things and making it really challenging on the rest of the world. Uh, it, it sounds like uh, uh, try and grow the market share as much as you can and pressure the uh, squeeze the, uh, the smaller guy that doesn't have the, the balance sheet to absorb all the expenses. Uh, yeah. Kind of a, you know, I, 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 the uh, comment you made about how um, uh, it's the combo effect of both the digital and the, the brick and mortar uh, and the strength, how that strengthens your uh, uh your presence and your brand and sales and all that as opposed to one or the other kind of thing. And, and that's interesting too, that, that uh, inflection point you mentioned about $10 million in sales that you know, it's, there is a quantifiable number where uh, in order to grow, you're, you're going to have to have some physical space. You can't just continue to be on online. Because it starts to get, um, it starts to get the customer acquisition starts cost starts to, get exceedingly high. Now you need distribution. Typically at that number, you need distribution across multiple markets, potentially nationally. And getting product from Maine to San Diego is not inexpensive. And so one of the easiest ways to do that is to, in a cheap way, is to, to start the stores. So um, that's what you're seeing to happen. And that's what's happened with digitally native brands. There's hundreds that have opened up brick and mortar stores, you know, uh, uh, the Caspers of the world, all these guys, uh, untuck it, Warby Parker, purple mattress just did four deals on the West coast. Um, there's, you know, no, it is interesting. Kind of the progression. I, I think at uh, one time, uh, not too long ago, uh, you know, I, I have uh, had numerous conversations with uh, peers that, uh, you know, have commented on the, uh, the millennials and, and subsequent generations, how comfortable they are with never talking to anybody or, or seeing anything, you know, and just, you know, clicking the button and having the Amazon truck pull up and drop it off at the house. Totally. Kind of um, but, you know, there is that, uh, there's some sort of a need for interaction. And I think that, you know, that it sounds like clearly that the numbers support that in order to continue to grow and uh, you know fully establish your brand and give it some some longevity. I mean, it sounds also like that there, you know, it's all kind of a. a um, what I'm trying to say it, it, it's in it, it, it's still defining itself. I mean, it sounds like you know, like the big boys are are happy to spend the money to uh, maintain or or, or leverage uh, and grow their their market share, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't prevent somebody with a new idea from getting started, right? I mean, yeah, so there's no, there's no one size fits all and no one has the answers today and everyone's trying anything they possibly can, right? You see things like Nike, who's made the decision that they want to do as much as they can with a limited amount of partners, 
like they have a great relationship with Foot Locker and, but, you know, or Hibbit Sports and groups like that. And they want to do, and they want to do a lot direct to consumer in their stores and uh, online. And so they went on Amazon and then they came off Amazon. They don't want to, you know, they don't want their brand, you know, to be affected by the channel in which they sold and they're protecting that. You know, there's companies like Duluth Trading and a lot of these direct to consumer brands who, um, you know, protect their channel and there's only so many places you can buy it, which creates that scarcity factor that people want it. You know, Amazon is amazing at what they do. Uh, you know, they've, I, I think what they're, you know, what they're great at and what they're continue to be great at is amazing at commodities. Commodities are probably a good place, you know, online's a good place to sell commodities if you can sell it cheaply like Amazon, which most people can't. And if you can get it uh, to the consumer as fast as possible. I think, you know, where I sit on it is that there's actually a need for brick and mortar, not this, you know, how do we get consumers into the shopping center? And you see things like creating this experience and experiential retailing, which is all great. But I have a fundamental view that there's actual long term, you know, long term, there's a need for brick and mortar from a customer service perspective, from an economics perspective, you know, let's let's not forget that oil prices where they are today. In 2008, they were $100 a gallon. Oil prices goes up or $100 a barrel. Oil prices go to $100 a barrel. I assume that does something to shipping for everybody. And so, you know, maybe we'll, maybe it'll never get there. I'm not a commodities trader and don't know, but uh, it seems likely at some point in time that energy costs will rise and commodities will go up and that will have a major impact on transportation. And so I think there's an actual need. Um, I, I don't fall into this category of the serendipitous nature of the experience of going to the store. That's great. And that has a place in placemaking and um, community building. I think that's all great. And there is a place for that. I take it another step where I believe there's an actual need, a necessity for brick and mortar. Whether convenience, what if I want it right now? What if I need it right now? Right? The, I don't have diapers now. Right. I can't wait for Amazon, even if it's hours. I need to change the diaper now. The convenience factor, at the economics factor, and then the customer service factor, right? That at some point, you know, we're not at a point yet today where bots, chat bots, and, you know, emailing customer service is getting the responses and answers and solutions that we all want. Uh, so, you know, the customer service, the convenience, and the economics all make brick and mortar a necessity. You throw in the experiential retailing, placemaking, a reason to come out, the community building, and it just elevates it. Got it. Hey, um, just kind of curious, do you see the configuration of retail, uh, the space changing? I mean, is that, is that one of the things that, that is changing? I mean, is a, the size of a store, um, you know, is any of that, do you see any of that changing in the last few years or based on this? I, I, I it's definitely one of the biggest challenges as a landlord that you face. Uh, retailers are changing store prototypes, you know, fast and furiously to try to meet consumer demands. As the consumer shopping habits are changing at a much rapid pace, they need ways to physically service them. And so, it's not just size, it's layout, it's what's in the store, it's inventory control, it's a lot of things. And so pro store prototypes are changing all the time, which, you know, uh, makes it challenging for sure. Got it, got it. Those That's are, those are CapEx intensive, right? When you, when you want to make a, a switch, especially if you're a large chain and it's not a one store switch, right? If, you and me own our t-shirt shop and 
we need to be 3,000 feet bigger. We either go find a new space, we expand in place. That's easy. If you have 4,000 stores and you need to meet consumer demands now, you have a challenge to do that. Right, right. No, I, it, it is a kind of a Rubik's Cube kind of thing. And I, I think one of the things that uh, you've mentioned here that I find uh, fascinating is how much, it, how much of it is driven by the consumer uh, you know, and then the, and their behavior as opposed to the reverse. I think sometimes it feels like the, the stores are changing the things and we're having to change, but it sounds like the stores are actually more attuned to what's going on with the, the consumer and trying to meet those needs and, uh, you know, to, to make it profitable and, 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 uh, work for them. So, yeah, I think the consumer is driving the bus on a lot of things, you know, one of the biggest challenges with department stores, uh, and they're one of the ones that get hit the most in headline news from Sears to pennies, um, is, you know, their full price clothing. And there's now all these places where you can get a value, whether that's what we call the off price brands like TJ Maxx and Marshalls and Burlington stores and Ross or Nordstrom Rack and all those groups um, where you can get a value. And in the recession, uh, people got hooked on value and you know the department stores had to lower their prices and they've had a challenge getting them back up. Um, if you were a Bed Bath & Beyond consumer and you got the Bed Bath & Beyond coupon, right, that the 20% off that they sent to everyone was a challenge and still a challenge to get them off of that coupon. And so, you know, everyone struggled with that. There was a race to the bottom. There still is. And that's just one area, which is price that, you know, consumer uh, retailers are reacting to consumers. They're trying to predict the future of consumers, but consumers are definitely driving the bus on a lot of things. Listen, you know, they're driving the bus on the omni-channel retailing or harmonious as, um, uh, one of my friends, Steve Dennis, says harmonious retailing, which is you need online and brick and mortar. You need the catalog. You need it all because they need to be able to buy you in whichever way they want to buy you. Right, right. No, it's, it's fascinating, and it uh, sounds like it's a dynamic marketplace, and that's going to continue. Um, hey, Chris, if we could uh, just shift gears here a minute. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier by day that I'm an insurance broker. And uh, I work with clients to uh, assess risk and, uh, you know, manage the risk, if you will. And there's a couple of different strategies we typically uh, look to employ. Uh, the first is we ask, uh, can we avoid the risk? If that's not possible, uh, we ask, can we minimize the risk? And uh, if we can't minimize the risk or avoid the risk, then we look to transfer the risk. And, and that's essentially what an insurance policy is. And... Um, I've been asking all of my guests uh, if they could take a look at uh, their world and uh, identify for the listeners what they see is the, the biggest risk. And uh, so if you're willing, I'd uh, like to ask you, Chris Russa, what is the biggest risk? So I think both from a real estate end and a retail end, um, the biggest risk is human capital. and you know, when you have an industry that's been hammered by headline news, both the retail and the real estate, when someone really bright and smart graduates college, is that the industry they want to get into? And to solve the problems and the challenges that we were just talking about, you need really sharp, talented people from an industry perspective, you know. I always want those at DLC, but from an industry perspective, retailers, real estate, everybody needs really smart, sharp, talented people. And, you know, uh, you know, getting, uh, retail, you know, getting the bright, sharp people into retail store management training programs, you know, I don't know when the last time I talked to a millennial, uh, but the last time they said, when I graduate college, you know, I want to work at, you know, I want to be the store manager of Walmart that, you know, I don't hear a lot of people doing that. And I think it's a great job and there's a great career path, but the biggest risk is human capital, both on the retail side 
and the real estate side. You know, in the Great Recession, and the real estate side's not limited to my world, but in the Great Recession, you know, in all commercial real estate, very few people were hiring in 2008 to 2012. So you have this labor shortage. And I think the greatest risk is if call it commercial real estate and retail, if all the all the most talented people in the world move over to the tech world and no one comes into real estate, I think that's the greatest risk the industry has. No, I love that. That's, uh, you know, well said. And, and I think that, uh, you know, human capital is something that's clearly uh, in, will always be in demand. I mean, quality people are hard to find and they're always going to be in demand. And uh, well said. Um, Chris, before we uh, wrap this up, uh, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? So um, first you can go to dlcmgmt.com. That's uh, our company website. Second, uh, for all the listeners here, I'd love for you to check out our podcast, Retail Retold, where we the premise of the show is the story behind how that store ended up in your neighborhood. And we bring on guests to talk about, you know, when someone says, you know, they, they put that Starbucks over there, we bring you they and how that happened. And then uh, you can... Follow me on LinkedIn, Ressa on real estate. Got it. Chris Ressa. Well, I will uh, put that all in the show notes. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, again, uh, Chris, I want to say thanks for uh, taking the time. Uh, I've enjoyed talking with you, learned a lot, and I uh, hope we can do it again soon. I hope so too. Thanks so much. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Networks, C-R-E-P-N Radio.